uh, we do have an ASL interpreter. So if you see someone in the gallery who is uh, 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 providing ASL interpretation, Kayla, then she will, uh, she will uh, uh, pin her to your screen and then you'll be able to see that. Um, my name is Marcus Krieger. I'm the programming director for the Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County here uh, in Clay County. We're uh, uh, in Northwest Minnesota. If you're not from here, uh, I'm in the town of Moorhead, Minnesota across the, across the river from Fargo, North Dakota. Um, and uh, I, I also wanna say a big thank you to the members of the Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County who have oh, carried us through these past 90 years of existence and especially this COVID year, uh, more, more important than ever. If you like this sort of thing, consider being, a, being one of them, a member of, Clay, of the Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County. But uh, today we're here to talk about Moorhead's Felix Battle Statue, from slavery to soldier to the pioneer barber of the Red River Valley. Um, as I'm sure you've noticed, Civil War statues, monuments have been in the news for the past few years. And I guess by the past few years, this has been controversial ever since the Civil War ended. Uh, and, but recently, uh, people are paying attention to it again. Uh, and uh, the, the controversy right now is whether or not communities who don't want a, a Confederate statue should be able to take down a Confederate statue in their community. But for the last 150 years, we've been, this whole controversy has been about, I get you boil it down, it's how should we remember the Civil War and who should our heroes be? And, uh, you know, I, I was I talk, was having that conversation with myself one day, and I was saying to myself, you know, who deserves a statue a lot more than Robert E. Lee is Felix Battles. And then I thought, you know, I'm an artist. I know other artists. <laughs> um, White Moorhead is an arts town. Uh, if you go downtown uh, on on Main Avenue, we got to two giant murals dedicated to our zip code. I, why doesn't feel? Why don't we make a statue for Felix Battles? And so with the consultation of a bunch of people, uh, artists, people in the African-American community, uh, we said, let's do it. So who is Felix Battles? Um, he is one of Moorhead's earliest permanent residents, somebody I've been researching for 10 years, somebody that Mark Peel, our archivist, has been researching for about 30, 35 years, uh, Clay County archivist. Uh, and between us, by which I mean mostly Mark, because he's a lot better at this than I am, uh, we have gathered a lot of information in a big file that lets us piece together the life of a fascinating person. Uh, and we've been looking for ways of telling a story for a long time now. And the statue project is a, became kind of a, an, an, is a is kind of an illustration to a biography of Felix Battles. And it's given us the opportunity to tell a story to a lot of people in local news, in the Star Tribune, to schools, and to you right now. So obituaries are a good place to start to learn about somebody. Uh, this ran in the Moorhead Daily News, April 25, 1907. Felix Battles was one of the oldest residents of Moorhead, having resided here upwards of 30 years. Uh, this is when Moorhead's about 30 years old. During this time, it is probable that uh, very few knew he was a veteran of the Civil War, but such is a fact. He was a corporal in Company G, 18th Regiment, United States Colored Infantry, and served his country with honor for nearly three years. That that, that that's that's a mistake. He, we won the war a year after he a year after he joined up. So he served for a year. Um, uh, he never applied for a pension until about two years ago, when having suffered a stroke of paralysis, he was forced to close his barber shop. I'll skip some things. Felix was a quiet, unobtrusive man and was respected by all who knew him. And then it ends by saying Felix Battles was not a member of the GAR, and the GAR stands for the Grand Army of the Republic. Uh, they're a, a veterans group of Civil War Union veterans. They're the, the granddaddy of uh, the VFW and the American Legion today. Uh, not a member of the GAR, but all the old soldiers in the city will attend the services tomorrow afternoon, as will many old residents of the city. So 
What was Moorhead like back in Felix's day? Uh, here's in the upper right, we see a, um, uh, Felix's uh, family's listing, his house's listing in the 1885 Minnesota State Census. Um, Moorhead in 1885, Moorhead was founded uh, 150 years ago in the next month, 1871. Um, uh, we see Felix, his wife, Kate, he has a son, Richard. He had a daughter, Julia, but Julia died when she was about 10. Richard lived a long full life in Moorhead, but uh, never married, never had children to our knowledge. So to our knowledge, uh, Felix Battles has no direct descendants living today, uh, but he was still surrounded by family. The, the, all these people live in his house, the Gills, the Taylors, um, the Harrises. This is Kate Battles, his wife, Kate's extended family who joined Felix and Kate from Missouri. Um, and together, the Battles, the Gills, the Taylors, they help form the original African-American community of Fargo Moorhead. Uh, Moorhead had a population of 2,500 back then. Uh, there were 16 Moorheadians who were African-American and nine of them lived at Felix's house. So when, when uh, about two thirds of the population of Af the African-American population of your town lives in your house, I think, it's safe to say that you're an African-American leader. <laughs> um, and uh, so what uh, yeah, Moorhead didn't start in 1885, we didn't, Moorhead didn't have a large African-American community, but if you grew up, if you've ever lived in a small community, um, you know that you don't need big numbers to have big impacts. Um, and uh, so, it, and it's important, I think, to point out that the African-American community is there pretty much right at the beginning of our town. Uh, there are no known photographs of Felix Battles, but I just have a feeling he's in this picture. Uh, what we're looking at is a Grand Army of the Republic uh, parade, probably on Decoration Day, which is a, a holiday we now call Memorial Day, um, going down Center Avenue and Moorhead, so a bunch of Union Army veterans. Uh, the building to your uh, left uh, to the uh, closest to us on the left is uh, is the keeper block. Felix had a bar barber shop in that building. Uh, today, um, that would be right next door. That um, right about the middle of the picture would be Thai Orchid in Moorhead, the rest Thai restaurant. Um, so this is a Union Army Veterans Parade with a bunch of people in the crowd out front. I just. I just got to believe that Corporal Battles was in here somewhere, in, either in the parade or in the crowd. Felix shows up in newspapers sometimes, like this one from uh, Moorhead Daily News, March 14, 1888. It says, Felix Battles, so well known in the two cities, he being the pioneer barber of the Red River Valley. That's kind of a cool title. Uh, he will open the Jay Cook Barber Shop. The inside will be thoroughly renovated and will be run in a true metropolitan style. Hot and cold baths can also be had at reasonable rates. Felix is a good barber and he will need no introduction in Moorhead. Uh, this, is, this building, this is, this is a fancy hotel, the Jay Cook uh, House. Um, this is on the corner of 8th Street and Center Avenue in Moorhead today. It is where the uh, Big Wells Fargo Bank is. Uh, and he is also, this is, this is something we just recently found digitized and, and we can't wait to dig deep into it. But right now we are, we are trying to finish up an exhibit, our big exhibit about the 150th anniversary of uh, Clay County. Uh, once that's done, we are going to be diving into The Appeal. The Appeal is a St. Paul African-American newspaper, but it, that also has society pages that pay attention to the rest of the region, like the large African American community in Fergus Falls, or as you can see, Moorhead and Fargo. Like this one here from 1892, everyone is pleased to see Mrs. Felix Battles out again as she is always looking around to find some poor sick person to whom she can give a helping hand. Or this one, 1898, Friday evening, the elites will give a hayrack party. 
After enjoying a pleasant drive, they will go to the home of Mr. and Mrs. F. Battles of Moorhead, where a fine supper will be served and where the young people will enjoy themselves dancing and playing games. Isn't that intriguing? Fargo Moorhead has an elite. And who are the who are the members of Moorhead's African Fargo Moorhead's African elite that are meeting at the Battles House? Um, one thing that you know, being an elite, probably Frank Gordon will be there. He's a, a barber in Fargo. Um, being a barber is one of the one of the one of the ways one of the rare avenues where an African American man in the 1800s could own their own business and uh, uh, in 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 America, you know, the all racism is illogical. But one of the weird illogical quirks of American racism is that um, the black men can be barbers, and so it it becomes a thing. There's there's whole books written about African American barbers. Um, uh, in American society, it's especially even uh, important even today in African American uh, uh, cult uh, societies too, a uh, culture. And um, uh, so that's an interesting avenue to study about Felix. Um, the earliest African American men that I know of who ran for public office were barbers in this area, uh, Prince Honeycutt in, in Fergus Falls and uh, Frank Gordon in Fargo. Uh, we are uh, really going to dive in, uh, uh, dig in deep uh, in this research uh, once the exhibit's up in September. Our museum, we're going to be making an exhibit at the MCOM Center in Moorhead about Fargo Moorhead area African American history from March to October of 1922. We're all very eager to get started on that. But back to Felix. So, um, Newspapers in the 1800s, I think, are a lot more interesting to read the newspapers today. If you're a newspaper reporter, I don't mean any offense. I just mean that they could be funny back then. Or in this case, they could try to be funny and be really bad at it, fail miserably at it. Um, brace yourself for some barber puns that would make my dad cringe. But this is about Felix. And if there's something about Felix, we put it in the file. <laughs> So uh, I apologize in advance for reading this. <laughs> we uh, ups and downs are often shown from youth to age and Felix Battles has battled his way. When still younger than he is, he found his home by merit. He became strapped and razor-like sharp. Felix never allows excruciatory feelings. If that is a joke, do not brush about it. I don't even know what these puns are supposed to mean half the time, but that is, it's, he is a colored man who may be remembered by many on the Mississippi and other father rivers as a tonsorial artist and in the many hotels as a polite employee thereof. See, that says that he worked on steamboats and um, as a barber and in hotels. So that's interesting. Two years ago, he located at Moorhead and became the representative of barbarism. Um, and so two years before this, this, this article says he came to Moorhead 1877. According to Felix's recollections, he said 1873, which is just two years after Moorhead's founding. So it says two chairs are almost constantly occupied, not only owing to his own capacity, but also that of I.J. Seckard, a gentleman whose experience and gentlemanly conduct cannot, be but, uh, cannot but be highly es estimated. A history of Felix battles would be interesting. Suffice it to say his friendly manners speak of their parents. A history of Felix Battles would be interesting. This guy, he doesn't know the half of it. And we didn't know the half of it either uh, because we knew nothing about his early life until we started on this project. We knew we, we had military records, we had what the newspapers said, but it didn't tell us anything about his childhood or where he's from other than he says, he, Felix said he's from Memphis. Um, until two years ago, when, after we start this project, we're, we're reading Felix's uh, obituary for the hundredth time, and it's something it, it suddenly pops out to us that Felix applied for a pension. He had a he had a stroke two years before he died, couldn't work anymore, so he applied for a government pension because he was in the army. And when you apply for a government pension, you've got to fill out information about yourself, it val a great and for valuable information to a historian. And because it's an old government document, it belongs to we the people, so we can so we ordered it, and it unleashed a logjam of information about his early life. 
like this. Where were you born? He says Mississippi. Uh, he, he says Memphis and other sources, but Memphis is a border town and right on the Mississippi River, or, or right on the, yeah, well, on the river, but near the state of Mississippi too. Um, where did you enlist? St. Paul, what was your occupation? Steamboating. He worked on Mississippi River steamboats. Uh, I'm, I'll get back to the middle. I'm going to jump to the end quick. Where have you lived since you, since you discharged from the Army? Worked on the, that says Northern Pacific, Brainerd, Duluth, till 1873. Since then have lived in Moorhead, Minnesota, worked as a barber. Now this is interesting. The Northern Pacific Railway that starts in Duluth, then they build west of the Pacific Ocean. They build Brainerd the next year. They build Moorhead and Fargo the next year. Then it's Bismarck. And then eventually they go out to Spokane and, uh, and Seattle. This is the railroad. This, is, this company created the Moorhead and Fargo. And I don't have enough information here to tell me that Felix was part of the crew that built the bridge, but it is intriguing. Um, and two years later, he says, 1873, he moves permanently to Moorhead. But then let's go back to number five. This was really important information. Were you a slave? And if so, name the name of all your former owners and particularly the name of your owner at the date of your enlistment. And he names her Mrs. L. Looks like Danson. Uh, lived five miles north of Hollow Springs, Mississippi. Well, obviously, we eagerly looked up the name and found no Mrs. L. Danson. We didn't even find a Hollow Springs, Mississippi. But at the bottom of the page, a different part of the uh, the the of uh, the 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 uh, uh, pension file, it it points out that Felix his stroke affected his speech. It paralyzed the right side of his face. Felix himself didn't write this document. He's dictating this when. When Felix was supposed to be going to elementary school, he wasn't being enslaved in, in near in Mississippi. And it was actually illegal to teach enslaved people how to read and write back then. Um, so if you, not Mrs. L. Danson of five miles north of Hollow Springs, Mississippi, but there is a Mrs. Eliza Dawson who lived five miles north of Holly Springs, Mississippi. Um, so, and, and she happens to be one of the largest enslavers of people in the Memphis area. You can see Memphis in the more up, upper left of your screen. And Mrs. Eliza Dawson or Liz Dawson or L. Dawson is the widow of William Dawson. And William Dawson is kind of famous. Um, he has his own Wikipedia page. He is what we call, what historians call a fire eater. The fire eaters were Southern politicians who um, paved the way for the Civil War by speaking out by by with pro-slavery rhetoric and anti and, and pro-secession rhetoric. Um, there, William Dawson has a county and a city named after him in Georgia. He has a Confederate company, Company C of the Third Georgia Infantry during the Civil War, was called the Dawson Grays. So, uh, but William Dawson himself didn't have to live with the consequences of his actions because he died a few years before the Civil War began. And he, he died in 1856, and he died without leaving a will. So his estate went to probate court. And what that means is that a couple of guys from the bank come over and they write down everything he owns and how much it's caught, how much it's worth so that it can be so it can be divided among William Dawson's sons in Georgia and his widow in Mississippi. And among the 400 page documents, uh, pages of documents that 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 uh, we found that Mark Peel or archivist found of William Dawson was a, a part of his estate or a, is a list of people that he's enslaving. And among the people is someone named Felix. And this is probably Moorhead's Felix battles as a 13 year old boy. It says he's worth $600. Bob at the top of the list, it says he is worth $1,100. Betsy and Baby, uh, that line says $900. There are three people, Sam and uh, Jimmy and oh, Simon, no, there's more, Liddy, 
there are four people on this page whose lives are worth, according to this piece of paper, one dollar. Can you imagine thinking that someone's life is worth one dollar? So me and Mark, our archivist, we both talked about how when we found this, when we first saw his, this name on this document, we were at first excited because it is so rare to find proof of life of someone who is enslaved in, the, in America in, in the 1800s, part of slavery. It's a process of dehumanization. It's just easier to be mean to somebody if you can convince yourself that this person is something less than human. So they, they try to convince themselves and everyone else that people were less than people. And so they, you get, it's so rare do you find proof of life from someone. So we both talked, me and Mark, we said we we're excited when we first saw this proof of life, but then immediately we felt icky because, I mean, here is this, Here's Felix, who we've come to know, you know, in our way, as a 13-year-old boy. He should be in seventh grade, but instead he's trapped in this system of slavery where people are mean to him his whole life and he doesn't get to do anything about it. He's being listed as a piece of farm machinery. So and it is, you know, we all know as Americans that slavery was bad, but I think that this for this, this piece of paper. Uh, nothing in my life has personalized the, the, that, that knowledge more than this piece of paper. Um, so this is a icky page. The next page we can be happy about. The next time we see Felix's name, he's not in Mississippi. He's in Dubuque, Iowa. It's June of 1860. This is the U.S. federal census, Dubuque, Iowa. He's, uh, and uh, he's, he's living, he is free. He's 18 years old and he's living with three people who share his last name. Mary Battles, age 50, John Battles, age 23, Elias Battles, age 20. These people are, we, it doesn't say who they are, what relation he is, they are to each other, but we, you know, they're probably family, old enough to be brothers and a mom, cousins and an aunt. Um, there, and there is a fantastic, amazing story here. We just don't know it. Um, we're, we're going to keep trying to find out everything we can about this, you know, maybe I'm, I don't plan on stopping studying Felix for the, any, for the rest of my life. Um, but I can't find Mary or John or Elias battles in any other documents that I'm looking at. So, um, uh, but I'll keep looking. Um, and so they don't live at the Dawson estate. They're not in that Dawson file. They're not on this file. So where are they? And so if you'll permit me, I'll just, just do some spec, I don't wanna say speculation, but hypothesis. Um, if now, but when you, when you Google, or not Google, but when you, when you look for records for the name Battles in, Memphis, in the Memphis area. And again, Felix says he's from Memphis. The name of William Battle III comes up. William Battle III is another one of the largest enslavers of this region. Um, and a lot of times that, uh, you know, last names were fluid among a lot of different or, uh, cultures in, in the 1800s in America. Scandinavian last names were fluid. African-American last names were fluid in the, in the, in the 1800s. And a lot of African-Americans, uh, I their last names are associated in some way with the plantation that they lived on or were, or, or were born on uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, so it's possible that will it, that Felix and Elias and John and, and Mary at one time or lived on the battle plantation. And I, I'm looking for the, the, the evidence. You know, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that points me in the direction that William Battle III and Eliza Dawson are related. They're some kind of cousin. They both have roots in North Carolina. They have, I, I just might have to go down to Memphis or to look in an archive to find something, but the digitized stuff isn't, isn't proof positive. Maybe somebody watching this presentation can crowdsource. Yeah, these people are cousins. So the, so the, uh, the, the hypothesis is that, may, that maybe Felix was born on the battle plantation and at some point William does some human trafficking and trades a enslaved kid to Eliza Dawson, his cousin, 
and that's where that's where we find Felix in 1856 on that piece of paper. And now, when someone's enslaver dies, when William Dawson died, when someone's enslaver dies, that is a very good time, a very common time for people who are enslaved to try to make a break for freedom. And the reason is the main reason is that this guy's estate is about to be broken up. And if you're being enslaved by that person, then you are part of that estate. And, and so again, William Dawson's uh, sons live in Georgia. Fe uh, Felix lives with Eliza in, in, in Mississippi. If, he ever want, if, if you ever wanna see your family and friends again, you might be shipped off. So that's when a lot of that's when a lot of people uh, with the death of a of an enslaver. It's when a lot of people uh, decide that well, it's now or never. Let's make a break for it. So uh, it is possible that Eliza Dawson frees Felix Battles willingly, um, but that that does happen. It's rare, and when it happens, it leaves a document called a manumission record um, that says this person is now free. Uh, I can find uh, digitally no manumission records for a Felix or a Mary or an Elias or a John Battles. So I think all signs. Um, oh, and I also had some local historians down in Mississippi look for me too, and they didn't find any. So I think all signs um, point to Felix found his own freedom, made his own freedom. He outran his pursuers, he outsmarted his pursuers, and he made his way north. Um, oh, and by the way, that okay, the, and so this is just uh, this slide here. So the, the idea that John and Elias and Felix and, and, and Mary all lived on the battle plantation, there is some circumstantial evidence that backs it up. What we're looking at here is the 1850 slave schedule of William Battle III. The, the slave schedule is part of the U.S. Census, and what it is, it's, it's, it's counting enslaved people um, um, so that two thirds of that number can go to giving uh, Southern states more representatives in Congress and skewing the electoral college towards Southern states. Um, so William Battle, he's uh, the, what we're looking at, it doesn't name people by name, but it says ages and gender. So what we're looking at here, the top says William Battle has a two-year-old male, a five-year-old male. The next two are 11 month old babies, male, a little baby boys that he's enslaving, a 61 year old female and so on. In 1850, he was enslaving 69 people and four of them were Felix's age. In 1860, and remember in 1860, the battles, the four battles that we're talking about here are not in the South, they're in Dubuque, Iowa. In 1860, William Battle III is enslaving fewer people, 51 people, none of them are Felix's age. And he is also absent people ages, the ages of Mary, John, and Elias. So again, the circumstantial evidence, but maybe someday I'll go to, go to Memphis, <laughs> check that out. So the Civil War begins in April of 1861. Felix is, during the Civil War, Felix is in St. Paul working on steamboats, and he initially does not join the Union Army because he is not allowed to join the United States Army. Now, African-American men served uh, in, in integrated units in the Revolutionary War, in the War of 1812, but the system of slavery um, and uh, racial relations had actually gotten worse and more illogically cruel, more messed up since the founding father days even. So uh, black soldiers are banned from the army. Uh, so uh, until the Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect, January 1, 1863. And the Emancipation Proclamation, we remember it as this is when Abraham Lincoln says that on this date, all everyone enslaved in the rebelling states um, uh, as of this date will be thenceforth and forever free. Uh, but a, a clause of the Emancipation Proclamation called for the active recruitment of African-American men into the United States Army. Uh, the most famous unit of African-American men, um, soldiers in the war was the 54th Massachusetts. Uh, it's famous in our day because of the movie Glory. It was famous in their day too, because but it, it's the most famous unit in the in the Civil War days too, though, because 
Well, while there were other early African-American units in Louisiana and South Carolina and Kansas, all raised black units, um, this was, the 54th Massachusetts was the first raised in the North. And uh, so and the North is the media, you know, the media uh, 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 headquarters of the United States. So all eyes were on them because like, let's face it, the North was plenty racist too. There were a lot of racists in the North as well. And, um, so there are a lot, and there are a lot of people, therefore, skeptical that African American men would make good soldiers, would be able to fight, would stand up to men who formerly enslaved them, and so everybody was watching to see how the Fifty Fourth Massachusetts did, and so that battle at the end of the movie, uh, the Battle of Fort Wagner in July 18, 1863, that was a battle that was important in American history, and. Um, I don't want to spoil the ending of the movie, but this thing happened 160 or so years ago. So, you know, you should know. <laughs> but um, so this was an impossible charge uh, against an, an impossible target. And the 54th Massachusetts requested the honor of being the first in and they were cut to pieces. Um, they lost maybe half their strength. Their commanding officer was killed. Um, but Everyone who was there, again, I said this is a, this is a media, um, um, uh, the, the media is paying attention to this. All the reporters and all the fellow American soldiers who are watching them almost take the impossible fort. Um, they, it changed some minds. They knew that black men could fight. This uh, was also proven in the Battle of Milliken's Bend where a new force of just raw recruits, brand new black soldiers um, were, uh, they were just learning how to, how to fire a rifle, which back in the Civil War times, you know, watch the movie Glory, you'll find out it's kind of hard. <laughs> you know, it's, there are some steps to this. Um, uh, they were, they were uh, ambushed by a, a big group of Confederate cavalry. And admittedly, the black soldiers were lousy shots because they didn't know how to, how to shoot yet, but they didn't, need, they didn't need bullets. With bayonets and the butts of unloaded rifles, they fought off the Confederate cavalry. And so the United States Army, the high ups, they saw these reports and they're like, we need some more of this. So active recruitment began in earnest. Um, they became, these units became federalized, um, and which means it, there wasn't going to be a fifth, you know, there wasn't going to be other Massachusetts or Minnesota African American units. They were all the United States, it was colored troops. Uh, so you had things like the 20th United States Colored Infantry or the 2nd U.S. Colored Cavalry or the uh, 3rd U.S. Colored Artillery. Um, According to the African American Museum of the, in the, of the Civil War in, in Washington, 209,145 African Americans served in U.S. uniform. Um, that accounts for one out of 10 U.S. soldiers and one out of four sailors. And uh, I will point out that as a uh, as a, a proud grandson and nephew of U.S. Navy sailors, uh, the, the U.S. Navy was integrated at the beginning of the Civil War, uh, and the the, the they, these African-American sailors served on U.S. Navy ships since the beginning on integrated ships. Um, I'd also like to point out that these, those 209,000 soldiers, they served, they were, they served right at the end of the war, the part of the war that we won. Um, you know, it, uh, they, for the first two years of the war, they weren't allowed to serve in uniform. So that one out of 10 soldiers is actually weighted at the end. We would not have won the Civil War were it not for uh, the USCT, and that's not me saying that, that's, that's Abraham Lincoln who said that. Uh, uh, USCT units as a whole uh, were kind of became, had a reputation for being really good, for being kind of, kind of elite or crack units. And a lot of it had to do with, you can't get soldiers who are more committed to this cause. Um, uh, fighting, they, they were, the, the, the the average USCT soldier was born and raised as enslaved, and he that that guy found his freedom, and risked it all again to save everybody, to to free everybody who he left behind. Um, to the, the African American families had been dreaming of this opportunity to overturn the system of slavery since uh, for generations, jubilee, um, and. 
And so, yeah, they, they, this was a personal fight for all these guys. They were also fighting to prove racial equality, that this all men created equal stuff was actually the truth in this country. Uh, they're, they're good words to start a country with. Let's we'll live up to it. Um, uh, they were, uh, it, it, it's got to be motivating if you were born, if you grew up as a slave, uh, to be fighting against people who, uh, enslavers, <laughs> um, you know, it's got to be motivating. They were fighting to avenge Southern atrocities. Um, the Confederate army committed terrible war crimes and atrocities against African American U.S. soldiers. Um, a lot of times they try to surrender, they just keep shooting. Um, the massacre of Fort Pillow that was just, you read, you read the accounts of the survivors of the massacres of Fort Pillow, it sounds like it happened in Ukraine in the 1940s. And it, it, is, it is really shocking uh, what was done. Um, but these atrocities backfired on the Confederacy because um, Avenge Fort Pillow became a battle cry among Union soldiers. And it also changed a lot of minds of Northern racists who were like, you know, said, you know, I don't care what color this guy is. This is an American soldier you're doing this to. Um, and also by a weird quirk that I'm not gonna defend, but it's, it's uh, um, uh, a, a, a quirk of, of Northern racism. They were led by the smartest officers. So it, in, in, a, in, in all the other units and the white units say I wanted to start the 20th Minnesota. If I can get a thousand guys to, to uh, join the 20th Minnesota, uh, I'll probably be an officer, maybe the captain of the unit. And I don't know anything about being an officer. I'd make a terrible, <laughs> a terrible officer. Uh, the, 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 the US Army and the Confederate Army were both filled with um, terrible officers who are there to pad their resumes during the war. Uh, political officers, um, but northern northern high ups in the army had initially such a low opinion of, of the idea of black soldiers, the racist uh, because of racism, um, that they said we're not going to let that happen in the USCT units. Um, we're only going to let uh, we're going to make people apply, and we're going to make all these all these unit all these white officers uh, take a test. Oh, I, and I, oh, I, I think I might have forgotten to mention that in the in the USCT, only um, only white their only white officers were allowed. African American men could be privates, corporals, or sergeants. Um, but uh, if you're a lieutenant or above, all of those officers were white. That was a racist um, uh, a racist policy, and um, and to in order to be a, a USCT officer, you had to pass a test. Half of the officers failed. Which means that, yeah, yeah, I'm not defending the practice. It's a bad practice. However, by by this this quirk made it so that the most committed soldiers in the Union Army were led by the smartest officers, and all of these and 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 officers and soldiers alike were reluctant to surrender because another one of the Confederate war crimes was. Um, was uh, a, a there was a, a official Confederate policy of the of the of you know it was pol political policy that uh, black soldiers but black U.S. soldiers were not soldiers they were rebelling slaves and their white officers were not soldiers they were leaders of a slave revolt and officially on they they, they were to be re-enslaved or executed on site white officers were supposed to be executed. And this again, atrocities backfire. This may, you know, the, the USCT units went into every battle knowing that it's do or die today. And uh, so they, they fought, you know, you, you couldn't fight harder. Um, you're not gonna surrender. Um, and since they weren't allowed to surrender, a lot of times they weren't too, they get a, gained a reputation for not being too eager to let their enemy surrender either. Um, and uh, the Confederate units would go up, face a USCT unit, and when they would see that the, this unit is waving a black flag, that meant that none of us are going to surrender today, and we're also not going to take any prisoners. So the Confederate, sol Confederate soldiers did everything they could to surrender to a white unit instead of a black unit. What we see on the left here is the battle flag for the 22nd U.S. Colored Infantry, and you know what I see. You know, you might see a, a we could see maybe a soldier taking a, a, a Confederate officer waving a white flag prisoner. 
if you were a Confederate soldier, do you think that that bayonet's going to stop right there? Or is it, <laughs> um, you know, th and th this is a pretty hard, this is a, this is a intimidating battle flag, I would say. Um, and this battle flag is also has links to Clay County, Minnesota. The captain of this unit was Luther Osborne. Uh, Luther Osborne, uh, after the war, he moved to the frontier city of Glendon, Minnesota, Clay County, uh, and ran the Red River Star newspaper. Uh, here's a photo of, uh, of Captain Osborne on the right. He's with the sword. That sword he's holding in his hand is in the, the collection of our museum. Um, uh, Luther Osborne and uh, Felix Battles were the only two USCT veterans that we know of in Clay County, and they live 10 miles apart from each other. I've seen photos of Luther as an old man. He's got a full head of hair. He needs a barber from time to time. I will bet you all my baseball cards that uh, these guys knew each other. Back to Felix, though. Um, on August 8th, 1864, Felix Battles goes to uh, Fort Snelling, and he joins the U.S. Army. Uh, he's one of 106 uh, Minnesotans of African descent who joined the Army from Fort Snelling. Uh, that's not enough to make a to make a regiment. You need a thousand guys to make a regiment. So uh, our our Minnesotans tended to go down south to St. Louis and join uh, join uh, regiments of Missouri guys. The a lot of the 18 uh, most of our guys were in the most of the Minnesotans were either in the 18th or 68th USCT. Felix was in the 18th. And uh, also note that uh, Felix during his army career, he, uh, his name is spelled with a PH. I think that's kind of neat. Although Felix himself did not sign that. Uh, he, uh, his name, he made an X and it says his mark uh, because Felix, when he was going to school, uh, when he should have been going to school, he was being enslaved on a cotton plantation. Uh, and one thing, my uh, one thing that I'm, I'm that Felix is making has made me reconsider is everybody. We always we always um, uh, talk about this war in terms of the North versus the South, but I'm starting to have a reaction against that because while while Minnesota would like to claim Felix Battles as our own, Mississippi might also want to claim Felix Battles of, as their own. Um, and uh, there were seventeen thousand five hundred Mississippians fighting as Yankees uh, in it in the Union Army. These are Southern men. Uh, all but 500 were African American. So, um, you know, also the German, Im German immigrants in Texas and Missouri uh, were having none of this Confederacy stuff, anti-Confederate. Um, West Virginia broke off from Virginia because they hated the Confederacy. This isn't a North versus South war because look at, and look at all the, 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 the Southern men, and mostly in the USCT who are fighting in the Union Army. Um, um, but uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a Union versus Confederacy war, I think. We have his muster rolls. Felix was a good soldier. We know this because he was promoted to corporal on November 1st, uh, two months after he joins the army. Um, uh, again, uh, African-American men could be privates, corporals, or sergeants. If you're anything above that, uh, they had to be white. Um, and Felix is at an important battle. Felix is at the Battle of Nashville. This is one of the one of the most important final battles of the war, December 15 and 16, 1864. Um, at this is an important battle for African Americans. There's a lot of USCT soldiers in this war. This is an important battle for Minnesotans. Uh, Minnesota, we had the uh, oh, I gotta check my notes here. We had we had a lot of regiments. The fifth, seventh, ninth, and tenth Minnesota infantry were in this battle. More Minnesotans died in this battle than in uh, than in any other battle in the Civil War. And to and to that list of Minnesota infantry units, we should add the 18th USCT, the because there's Minnesotans in that unit as well. So what's going on at this at this battle? Um, it's, toward, it's at the end of the war. Ulysses Grant is just waiting till spring to finish off Robert E. Lee's army in Virginia. Um, General Sherman is burning his way unopposed through the Carolinas. And out west, there is one more major Confederate army who is trying to turn the tide. And so the Confederate general, John Bell Hood, goes to Nashville to challenge his old West Point professor to a fight. And Hood gets schooled. Um, I guess, uh, long story short, um, 
On December 15th, there was a major Confederate army in the West and on the, at the end of the battle, uh, that army was no longer. Uh, there, that army, they, they, it did, they didn't even reconstitute. They, 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 it, the, there was no more Confederate army, major Confederate army of the West. It was guerrilla action from then on. Um, so it's an important battle of the war. And because of this battle, or, or, and, and somehow uh, the Confederate general, John Bell Hood, we honor him by naming Fort Hood in Texas after him, where my, where my dad did some service in the army. Um, so, you know, not only was this guy trying to, oh, overthrow the U.S. government, but he wasn't even doing a very good job of it. <laughs> you know, we all have, uh, uh, General Sherman is famous for burning down Atlanta. General Hood actually burned down Atlanta on his way retreating and, and uh, accidentally burned the town down and General Sherman put the fire out actually. So, um, so which brings us up to today. Um, 156 years after the war, we are looking, a lot of us are looking around and noticing why are there so many statues of Confederates who lost the war rather than Union soldiers who won the war. Um, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center charted 1,503 Confederate symbols by kind and date. You can see here the blue dots are monuments in front of uh, courthouses, green dots are schools, the red dots are everything else. Um, now there's, there is two things going on here. Admittedly, um, this, the South lost a generation of men um, and it is appropriate to mourn the loss of dead loved ones. On the other hand, it, it can't be denied. You look at these stats, this, these statues, these monuments were put up as part of the, um, the, the, the culture of intimidation against African-Americans uh, that reestablished white supremacy in the years after the Civil War um, in the 1870s going up until, you know, who knows. Um, um, so, and there's a pattern to these. You can see it in the pattern. Um, 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson. This is when, this is when uh, uh, segregation was legalized. Uh, separate but equal was, was, was said okay. Um, that's when you get your big influx of monuments in front of courthouse grounds. And those monuments are there to say, Confederates are in charge. You know, we're, we don't call ourselves the Confederates anymore, but we, we, are, we are the ones who are in charge of the government. Black people don't get to vote anymore. Um, when do schools start getting named after, um, uh, after, after uh, Confederate leaders? It happens in, after 1954 is the major wave of it. That's when Brown versus Board of Education uh, uh, said that it calls for school integration. And so then to be, uh, I guess, uh, mean, they would said, well, if, if, if black kids are gonna go to our school, we're gonna name it, you know, Robert E. Lee Junior High. So, uh, and also as part of this campaign of intimidation against African-Americans, the role that the, uh, that the USCT played in winning the civil war was intentionally written out of the history books. They were by many people forgotten. They weren't part of the narrative because Southern white supremacists cannot have a narrative that, that includes uh, victorious African-American soldiers overthrowing white supremacy in 1865. Black men and women are not allowed to have heroes in, a, in Jim, the Jim Crow South, not like that. Uh, that was too powerful. So, so these, these, yeah. You know. So the monuments are problematic, but however, there are not all monuments, not all Civil War monuments are Confederate monuments. There's a whole heck of a lot of Union monuments. Um, if you go, yeah, we here here in Fargo on the in on Broadway at the foot of uh, at the the foot of Broadway in Island Park, we have a Civil War statue, as do many uh, Northern towns throughout. Uh, throughout America have Civil War uh, Union statues. Um, if you go to Gettysburg, every, every regiment, uh, every Union regiment of Gettysburg has a statue, a monument marking where they served that day. And in Minnesota, we have two monuments dedicated to the soldiers who fought, at, uh, the Minnesotans who fought at Nashville. One was put up in 1921. Um, at um, uh, uh, where the, during the lifetime of those Civil War veterans um, uh, in, uh, in the part of, in the, the, the Nashville National Cemetery where the Union soldiers were buried. 
And uh, one was put up very recently, 2014, on the battlefield itself, uh, where the Minnesotans fought. And Minnesota has not stopped remembering the Battle of Nashville. We, we've not, America as a whole has not stopped remembering the Civil War. And African Americans have not stopped thinking about the Battle of Nashville. In 2006, uh, uh, this statue was put up at Nashville National Cemetery to honor the 1,910 USCT soldiers who are buried here. Now there, there I, I don't know if there's a definitive list of, of monuments dedicated to African American contributions to the Civil War, but from what I can find on the internet, the best, you know, it, there's maybe 30, 35 of them. Um, so there's not very many. There should be more. And there will be more, and I know there will be more because the, at least a third or maybe a half of these monuments, these 30, 35 monuments were dedicated since the 1990s. So what we're talking about with Felix Battles here, this building of statue for Felix Battles in uniform in Moorhead, Minnesota. Um, this is part of a, I guess, series of this campaign of, of people trying to retell stories that, uh, try, trying to, to bring to light stories that have been intentionally overlooked for the last 150 years. Um, but I think it's still happening seldom enough that our little statue in our little town um, will be of some, will have something to say nationally, uh, however small. Um, and I think that there, there's a lot of Civil War nerds like me and Civil War nerds like me, uh, a lot of them are going to know the name of Felix Battles and maybe they'll come to Minnesota to come take a good picture by him. Which brings us to the statue project itself. Um, I am not, uh, certainly not the greatest artist that there is, but I am the greatest artist that I can afford. <laughs> um, um, so, uh, I bet, and by talking with other people, other really good artists, uh, I came up on, I came up with this. So uh, again, there are no, no known photographs of Felix Battles. So what I did is I took this photograph of an unnamed African-American soldier. I turned him into a stencil. And a stencil, I, and, and I blew the stencil up to be five foot eight inches tall, which is the height of Felix Battles according to documents that we have. Um, I did specifically choose the stencil because uh, stencils are used in graffiti in the hip hop tradition and uh, graffiti in the hip hop tradition along, uh, is one of the great artistic, uh, one of the great art forms African-Americans have given to the world uh, along with you know, rock and roll and jazz and the list goes on forever. Uh, so it is kind of a nod to African-American artists um, uh, that I uh, respect. Um, so uh, originally it was going to be, the, the, this was good, the idea was going to be a painting that I would put somewhere with permission, of course. Um, but then I met Lyle Landstrom. And Lyle Landstrom, he's a neighbor of mine. Um, I see his house from my house and uh, we both live a block or two, two blocks, three blocks away from Felix, from where Felix used to live. Um, and uh, Felix is a civil engineer with uh, the city of Fargo. Uh, he is also a wild biker dude and a uh, banjo player. And for fun, he cuts stuff out of metal. And together we came up with the idea of what if the stencil itself is the finished work of art rather than a painting. So, the, so this is going to be life-size, thick steel, um, and it's going to have an interpretive panel attached to it which will, or off to the side of it, which will tell the Felix's life story from his childhood in the South, his army days, his life in early Moorhead, maybe early Moorhead's African American community. Um, and where this will be put is, well, we haven't figured that out yet. Um, just last week, actually, we, we formed a group, uh, we had our first meeting of a group of, of African American leaders in Moorhead who's gonna guide this project going forward. We had a fantastic meeting and, and the, the people, uh, the, the people uh, in this room are just really, it's, it's exciting to be in the room. We got former mayor, current judge, Jonathan Judd of Moorhead. Uh, Ernest Lamb is the Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities at Minnesota State University, Moorhead, which is where I went to school, go Dragons. Also from MSUM is Jared Pigeon, the Director of Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, of that university. Uh, Rachel Stone is an entrepreneur and a member of the Moorhead School Board, which, uh, and also a, 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 used to work with us here at our museum. 
Uh, Matura Lear is also from Moorhead Public Schools. Faith Dixon is an entrepreneur and a local leader in the Black Lives Matter movement. And Devon Condell is a professor emeritus at Minnesota State University and a person of real historic importance in our community. And it's always, always an honor to share a room with Devon. And this group will decide where best to place a statue, how to go about it. They even had some interesting ideas about uh, expanding the project a little bit. So stay tuned for that. Um, and I am happy to say that we've already had some successes. Um, uh, Felix Battles has a beer. <laughs> um, uh, Junkyard Brewing Company in Morehead, Minnesota um, uh, collaborated with Back Channel Brewing Company of, of Lake Minnetonka. And, uh, uh, back channel made Felix Battles the beer. Uh, it is a Bundt Cake imperial style imperial stout. It is strong and black and delicious. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, in order to, th this project started, um, uh, went public at the Junkyard Brewing Company. That was our fundraiser for the project uh, in May of 2018. And I was happy to say that by the time I got on stage to tell Felix's story, uh, uh, I could say that we already had the funds raised for it. So um, we expanded the project a little bit since then and you know, had a trade war with China that made steel go up, but I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not envisioning money to be a problem. And another great, um, 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 great success, I think is in 2019, we had all the Moorhead junior high kids come to hear a presentation about Felix and um, and uh, th this this letter this this note was uh, was shared with me after that. It said, "Hey, I'm Hamida from Horizon Middle School. We came to your center on Friday to check out some exhibitions. I would like to thank you guys for telling us about Felix Battles. To me, it was a very special story. So thank you. I hope and pray that you guys are able to build him that statue because it's a great idea. Because it's an excellent idea. Thanks for your time and thanks for showing." and allowing me to know more about Felix Battles. So uh, uh, Davin, you can start getting questions ready, but I'll just end by just to finish up to say, and um, this statue can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, the, first, the first donation I got for this statue was from my barber in Moorhead. So barbers love him, uh, veterans love him. Um, for me, Felix has become a friend. I spent a lot of years with him. I say hello to him as I walk by where his house used to be in my neighborhood. And I want people to know his story and I want people, I want to do something nice for him. And, and um, I think that the USCT is, might be, is certainly one of the best stories America has. This, this army of enslaved, of formerly enslaved men who risked it all to, to, to free everyone, to free everybody they left behind. And uh, it's also, it, it's important to show our kids and our grownups in this town that's increasingly diverse, uh, that diversity has always been a part of our history here and that everybody belongs here and that this history in this town is your history too. So with that, if there's any questions, I'll stop sharing my screen there. Sure, uh, Marcus, can you hear me? I can. All right, so uh, Teresa writes that she came in a, a little late. Uh, when did Felix die and where is he buried? Felix died in 1907 in Moorhead. Uh, he's buried um, along with other family members in a Riverside Cemetery in North Moorhead. Okay. Um, there's a question. You mentioned that uh, some prominent um, local black men uh, worked as barbers. Uh, you mentioned Prince Honeycutt and um, Frank Gordon. Um, have you seen any other trends in the early black community of Fargo Moorhead? You know, common occupations or ages, things like that. I would say that um, I, I I am eager to delve deep into that. That that what um, you know the the day after we we put up this exhibit about about uh, Clay County's 150th, I'm going to be. I'm, I'm going to be starting on this. This is, this is, I'm excited for it. And I, I might ask that to you, Davin. You're the one that did more research on this so far than I have. Well, same answer for me. Um, we got a comment from, let's see, uh, that one of the early donors, uh, he's asking, 
uh, to the monument, what are the next steps? Is there some kind of timeline? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so um, the next step is uh, in September, the, this meeting of our advisory group is going to meet again. We're going to discuss uh, possible sites. Uh, the sites, the, 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 the factors of the sites will be, um, is this location significant to, um, to, to the life of Felix Battles? Or is this site significant to the life of people who live in Moorhead right now? Is this a good spot? Um, is this site safe? Um, um, is this, um, and what's this site going to look like in 50 years? You know, putting that one of the problems with this project is, you know, downtown Moorhead, downtown Moorhead's redevelopment program. Uh, what more, what downtown Moorhead is going to look like five years from now, I don't, has not been decided. And so it's, it makes it kind of, you know, it makes us kind of reluctant to. I'm not going to say we're reluctant to put it in downtown Moorhead because there's a lot of great spots in downtown Moorhead, but I also don't really want to move them again once I put them in cement in the ground. Okay. That, that was from Dave Scott, if you remember Dave Scott. Oh, cool. Thank you. Uh, Sam Y is asking here, is there any indication of racial, racial tension um, uh, in the relationships of African Americans in Moorhead at that time? Mm, again, this is a this is a, a something that we're really going to be looking at. Um, um, I fully expect that it would be hard to be a black man or a black woman or a black kid uh, living in rural Minnesota um, um, in in the eighteen hundreds and early nineteen hundreds. Um, um, they these each of these families would have faced a lot of adversity um, talking with Yvonne Condell who um, came here in the uh, 1960s with her husband uh, James and they were the they were the second and third members of a, of a, of a of reestablishing the African-American community in Moorhead in the 1960s there was some um, you know you know she's she's had to deal with adversity too but also um, I, I like what I, I'm, I'm heartened by what what was said in um, Felix's obituary that uh, you, you get the sense that um, he was respected as one of the old pioneers and one of the um, one of the um, big marks of respect of in that founding generation of 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 early early Moorhead was that if you were if you were one of the old pioneers there was some respect there. All right. Uh, beyond that, a lot of thanks to you, Marcus, for a great presentation, uh, but no more questions. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, Davin, for setting this up. And thanks, for, um, thanks to all the members of the Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County. Uh, thanks, folks.